Hello my friends. So today I want to uh, speak with you about just a few experiences that I've had at university that I think are telling as to what sort of people are teaching at universities these days and just the general air of acceptability in the culture of what's acceptable. And so the first story is from my very first week of class. I, I was in my one of my classes and um, the teaching assistant, the TA, is this younger black woman, kind of heavy set. And we were going through doing introductions, or all the students were, and the professor kind of gave an introduction, and then she gave her introduction. And one of the first things she said was that she just had her second child or something. I think it was her second or third child. And she followed it up saying, and if you think having kids is all fun, well, you're wrong. Having kids is the worst. Don't have kids. Don't have kids. She actually said that. And she's like, oh, you're up all night, and you know, you think that you'll have any time to yourself? No. And she goes on this like tirade about not having kids. And she she's already a mother. And she's telling a classroom with a significant percentage of young female students not to have kids. And just like that really bothers me. And not only that, but what kind of a mother tells anybody that their kids, you know, are just horrible things and that they don't really, you know, she didn't stress anything about how wonderful it is or how much she loves her kids. There was no flip side where she says, oh, but all of that is worth it because, you know, you love your kids and it's, it's one of the best experiences that life can offer. There was nothing like that. It was just, don't have kids. You know, reflecting on this, I know exactly which kind of mother would do that. The kind of mother who goes to work all day at a university instead of taking care of their newborn children. And I think kids, I mean, yeah, kids are hard to raise. I mean, it's, it's a difficult, challenging experience. But you shouldn't resent your kids, and you shouldn't tell other people that it's such a horrible thing. It, it shows such immaturity, in my opinion. And especially so for somebody who is in a position of presumed leadership, of authority and power over these kids. I mean, she's grading their tests and kids in college do look up to their professors and the people like teaching assistants more than you would think. They do have a position of authority. So it's, it's messed up that she said that. I really don't like that. So that's the first thing. The second thing just actually happened today, which is what is prompting this video. Um, in my European history class, we've been learning about the Industrial Revolution. And today, we focused on public sanitation and the problems that urban centers were facing with regards to public sanitation and, you know, how dirty and nasty the cities were at that time. And toward the end of the lecture, the professor says that not many people were bathing despite the terrible conditions. And, I mean, he mentioned things like seepage, where drinking water would get contaminated with the waste that was being dumped in these cities, and so he admitted that that had something to do with it, but then, out of nowhere, the professor says, 
that Europeans in general, and this is a white guy, I think he's actually Jewish. His last name, I'm not gonna give his last name, but I think he is Jewish. Um, he says, Europeans in general had a cultural, a cultural aversion to bathing and swimming and swimming. He said, he's talked about how, how ship captains would go down with their ships if they ever crashed because they didn't know how to swim and that Europeans were generally afraid of water, that they didn't like water. They were dirty, stinky creatures that didn't bathe. He actually said this. I mean, imagine if you pointed out something, if a professor at a university pointed out something like that blacks can't swim, which is true. I mean, he's, he's talking bullshit about Europeans, but if you said something true, like blacks can't swim generally, uh, you would probably be run out of town, called a racist and a bigot and everything else. But if you tell a lie, such as the Europeans were culturally averse to bathing and swimming, that they were afraid of water, that's verbatim. I wish that I had recorded it. I usually record my classes, but I actually turned off the recorder just a couple minutes before he said that because it was at the very end of the class and I didn't think we were talking about anything else. But just as everyone was getting up, he started saying this. And... Um, so, I mean, I did research after I got out of class, and everybody knows about the bathhouses of ancient Greece and Rome. There's even, like, a tomb of the diver, uh, an ancient Greek tomb that shows a person diving into a pond or a pool. Um, so that shows that the Greeks and Romans, who were European, loved to bathe, and they loved to swim in the water. Julius Caesar, I found uh, while I was Googling like to swim and even if you fast forward past Rome uh, someone like King Eckbert uh, King of Wessex I think was he had a pool that he used frequently and it, some chronicler I read on Wikipedia said that King Eckbert um, was a practiced swimmer that he liked to practice swimming and if you look through the medieval chronicles, you'll find pictures of people swimming. It's not uncommon. Uh, and bathing. That last one was Greek, but there's certainly a continuity between the ancient Greek and ancient Germanic cultures, and if not a continuity, a direct relationship, as they came from the same origin. So, and when we look at their heroes, like Beowulf or Odysseus, they were both great swimmers. So that I. The cultural aversion to swimming, cultural aversion to water, fear of water. It's just, what is this guy talking about? So, and, and other chroniclers, um, this one, St. John of, or St. John of Abbott, I think it might have been, or the Saint, I forget the name, but I'll put it in, I'll edit it into the video later, but. He said that the Vikings who invaded Britain bathed at least once a week and they changed their clothes every day and um, I mean even the old Scandinavian term for Saturday was I forget what it was, but it translates to bathing day. Um, and I'll be right back. I'm going to get a smoothie.
and when you have a, a day named after the action of bathing, I think you can assume that it's more of a more culturally ingrained for them to bathe rather than for them to be culturally averse to bathing. It's, I, can, I still cannot believe that this guy said that. I mean, even like, even Tacitus, the Roman historian, said that of the, of the Germans, that, um, they bathed every morning. They bathed when they woke up in, in warm water. And that, uh, they would even bathe after meals. So... There's not really much in the historical record that says that Europeans were culturally averse to bathing. One other thing I wanted to add, the only people in Europe who were truly culturally averse to bathing were Christians. Uh, there are stories all over the internet of famous Christian saints and monks and whatnot who refused to bathe. They'd only bathe once a year. They'd only bathe, one of them had only bathed like two or three times in his whole life. So this was not a common European thing. This was an eccentric thing brought in by Christian fanatics. And um, also, at the start of the 16th century and later on with urbanization, it was a rational fear of stagnant water in cities that people wanted to avoid. Um, bathing itself was not ever something that Europeans in general were culturally averse to. I mean, you have, uh... Oops. You have that one Arab, the Muslim who traveled up with the Vikings, and he, he said that they were so dirty and stuff, but even he said that they bathed and that they washed, but he called them unclean because they didn't bathe in the, the Muslim traditional ways. So that doesn't really count. And yet, what this professor was saying is something, It's it pissed me off because it's something that I've actually heard from like black supremacists and you know, the, the melanin enriched philosophy where you know, melanin gives you a spiritual connection with uh, Yakub or whatever the fuck that whoever made Whitey down on some island in a laboratory, that black Muslim scientist who made Whitey. I hear those kinds of people say this shit all the time. Like, oh, the Moors taught Europeans how to bathe before the Africans and the Arabs came. Y'all whiteys were just living in the caves, not bathing. It's so... I, yeah, I can't believe I heard it from a professor. And this was like an older... Well, like I said, older white guy in, in quotes, in echoes. So, there's that. And there are another couple of things that I've heard and experienced around campus, but I think that's enough for one video. I'll actually tack on a couple of uh, sound clips after this. One is the same professor that said that whites are culturally averse to bathing, uh, talking about the white population decline and another in uh, one of my classes uh, it's actually it's a Catholic studies class it's the beginnings of the Catholic Church but we're learning a lot about Judaism because the professor is very clear that Catholicism and Christianity in general began as a Jewish religion and that it was founded by Jews and so we've learned about Judaism 
and uh, in this period we were talking about circumcision and I made a comment about circumcision that you might find funny I guess so I'll tack those on at the end apart from apart from all that I'm still not at work yet I still have like a half a block left so I'll add on, I guess I'll make some remarks about school in general. I am definitely a minority at this school. And it feels weird. I mean, there are other white people in my classes. But we're certainly the minority. And even when it comes to white people, it's very hard to find a Nordic looking, like someone like blonde or redhead or I actually have seen a few redheads but they, they're definitely Jewish so I don't know how the Jews got their red hair kind of bothers me but yeah so as like a tall fair haired light eyed Northern European, you're definitely in the minority at a major university in America these days. And, uh, you can feel it. I mean, nothing, nothing bad has happened. I haven't, like, faced discrimination, and I wouldn't expect to. But, it's just weird. And it's hard to find people who you really want to be friends with. Because that's another thing about it. It's almost... You you have to assume that... Um, most of the people there... 99.9% .9 of the people there... Are going to be hardcore... Feminist, Marxist, anti-white anti-male uh, down to like feeling an academic superior or an intellectual superiority for holding these beliefs and walking around in that environment is like walking around in a minefield you, you can't feel it's hard to feel comfortable and it's hard to make friends because I mean you don't want to open up to them It's just a bad idea. It's just going to turn into something not good. And when you don't want to open up to them, then it's hard to find the people who do agree with you because you're closed off. Because you you have to be defending yourself, really, from the potential for attack. So, and I even worry making these videos. Like, what if what if it gets back to my professors that I talk in my videos about them even if I'm not mentioning their names, I'm not mentioning the classes I, I still wonder how or if this could get back to me and how it could damage me but you know to me it's worth it, to me it's worth just speaking my truth and getting it out and connecting with you guys so thanks for watching so we'll get back to this when we talk about European imperialism in the latter 19th century, but one of the consequences of this is that by the turn of the 20th century, by the year 1900, Europe's populations account for some 30% of the aggregate world population, right, which has not yet been caught up in this demographic boom. Uh, so again, this is a portion of world population that Europeans had never before constituted, nor would they ever again. Right? I and mean, as you know, today, that portion of world population continues to drop. Males have done to them, presumably on the eighth day, sometimes later if, they're, if they convert to Judaism later in life, um, as a sign of their relationship with God. Okay, this, this was common to other sorts of religions in the Syrian region, but for the most part, um, circumcision was set Jews apart from other practitioners of religion in the Roman Empire. Okay. 
Um, important thing to keep in mind here, right? Circumcision, only male circumcision, not female circumcision. So if you're a woman living in the Roman Empire and you're Jewish, you're not circumcised. That should also tell you, right, which sex, right, in the ancient world, male or female, is higher than the other one in Judaism, right? The women are higher? No, men are. Oh. <laughs> um, women are afforded particular stations within Judaism, um, but all I mean, another way of putting this, right, is that it should be telling, right, that the sign of one's relationship with God is a sign that only men can display. Because I have just a perspective on circumcision that it's yeah. just mutilation, personally. So that's why I said that. That's why. I said yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand where you're coming from, right? And then that's a so so think of it differently, right? Um, in antiquity, in fact. Um, you're thinking of it how many non-Jews in the Roman Empire would think of it, right? Is that it's a sign of like mutilation, and why would you ever want to be circumcised, right? Um, but for Jews, it's a sign of their status as a special people who have a particular relationship with the God of Israel. 